If I could uh, quiet you down just a little bit. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, we have a number of people speaking today, so uh, we're going to get started uh, even as you start on your first course. I'm John Podesta. I'm the counselor to President Barack Obama, and I want to begin by both thanking Senator Kerry uh, for uh, inviting me to join you all today, but for uh, organizing this outstanding conference. It's really a testament to his leadership that so many people have come with so many commitments. So thank you, Senator Kerry. Uh, <laughs> Jules Verne's most famous character, Captain Nemo, said, the sea is everything. And of course, the people in this room know that, that is not hyperbole. Life on our planet would be impossible without the ocean. We know today that our actions can have a profound impact on the health of our oceans. Sometimes those impacts are negative, as when bits of plastic swirl into huge garbage patches or black market fishing enables criminal activity. But as we've heard throughout this conference, and as we'll hear in this session, individual leaders can have a tremendously positive effect on the oceans, too. The global commitment to ocean health and sustainability demonstrated throughout this conference is truly inspiring. As all of you heard this morning, President Obama has committed the United States to continue leading by example in protecting our oceans. In the months ahead, we'll be redoubling our efforts in marine research, in conservation, and against illegal fishing. I'll talk more about what these announcements mean and how they build on President Obama's national ocean policy at the end of our lunch program. But first, I'm thrilled to be joined here today by leading ocean policymakers from the U.S. and the European Union. Uh, European Commissioner for Maritime Affairs and Fisheries Maria Dominaki, U.S. Senator Sheldon Whitehouse and Lisa Murkowski, and U.S. Trade Representative Michael Froman. Our first speaker uh, is European Commissioner for Maritime Affairs and Fisheries, Maria Dominaki. In her time serving on the European Commission, Commissioner Dominaki has worked tirelessly, sometimes in the face of serious opposition, to make conservation a centerpiece of EU fisheries policy. She has also dedicated herself to preventing illegal uh, market seafood uh, from entering the European market. Please join me in welcoming our dear friend, Commissioner Dominaki. Good evening to everybody, Secretary Kerry, Prince Albert, Kathy. I would like to thank everybody for being here today. For me, it's a great honor to be given this opportunity. So, as we can understand, I'm very happy to speak about the oceans, but everything about oceans is said already, so really I don't have <laughs> to contribute a lot to that. But then they told me that I can speak about uh, how we can have a change in ocean policy. So yes, change is something on which uh, I can speak. I have some personal experience, and as you can understand, politicians love to speak about their personal experiences. So I'm going to say a few words about how we have achieved a new fisheries policy in the European Union and about our blue growth agenda, what is this and uh, what we are aiming at with this. First, a few words about uh, fisheries. When I took office, I have realized, everybody was talking about that, so I was obliged to realize that uh, our oceans policy, the European Union's ocean pol oceans policy, was not exactly what we call a success. It was uh, actually a flawed policy, and uh, a change was needed desperately. So, uh, in a way, I was lucky because I took my mandate when everybody would like to have this change. And this was really my weapon. This uh, was really the basis on which I have worked. I have uh, this uh, privilege to have a public opinion in the European Union that really wanted to have some change. And this is exactly what I try to take advantage of during my adventure, let me put it this way, to go for a new policy. So I started from fisheries for two reasons. Uh, I, everybody, of course, knows that uh, oceans are a very complicated system. We have heard about that uh, 
today a lot. So I, I have chosen to start for, from fisheries. And I would like to underline from the very first beginning that for a politician leader, the choices to prioritize is very, very important. Because I have heard during these two days a lot of good ideas. Yes, we have solutions almost for everything. But what will be our action plan? An action plan, as uh, Secretary Kerry said, is needed. So we have to prioritize. And fisheries was one of my priorities for two reasons. First, because on this uh, field, the uh, European Commission has an exclusive competence. I don't want to explain what the European Commission is doing. What I can say only is that it's more complicated than what your political system is doing. More complicated than even that. So, but uh, on fisheries, we, uh, European Commission has really a say. We have teeth. We have uh, an exclusive competence. That's why I have started uh, to work with fisheries. And then the other reason is that... Um, uh, public opinion uh, can feel this. Why? Even the fishermen can feel that in the European Union because there was no fish there to fish anymore. We have built, we have spent millions of euros of our taxpayers' uh, money for bigger and bigger vessels and then we have nothing to fish. So the people, the consumers, the fishermen, they need the change. So I, ch I have chosen fisheries. And I have worked day and night for two years building alliances, alliances and networking, and now we have a new policy. What I mean by a new policy? I mean really a new policy, a radical change against the current. That's why everybody had to pay a hard, a really hard cost, political cost, another kind of cost, I can say, to achieve that. But now we are fishing um, in a sustainable way, and it can be done. This is the message I would like to give to everybody. When I took office four years ago, we had only six or five stocks, six or seven stocks fished at sustainable levels. Now we have 28, and with a new policy, we are going up to 30, and then 2020, we are going to fish all commercial species in, at a sustainable level. This is a change. Also, we had a real change, and I can see, stay, just to give you an example, Prince Albert yesterday, I'm uh, saying to him now, he has helped a lot uh, by um, mobilizing a lot of people around uh, bluefin tuna. So, bluefin tuna is now going to be fished at sustainable levels. And not only in the European Union, but also globally. Because we had some very good international cooperation with the United States, and I would like to thank the United States government on that, but not only them, Japan, Norway, and also other important countries came on board, and now even China now wants to work with us in order so, you see, it can be done. This is my main message. So also we have a policy that uh, has to be implemented properly, and this comes me to the, gives me the lead to the second point I would like to mention, and this is enforcement. We have very good legal solutions now, but control and enforcement is absolutely necessary. And as we can understand, there are thousands of vessels, fishing vessels around the world, so we cannot uh, be the sheriffs running uh, against every fisherman. So in order to do that, we need our fishermen cooperation. And that's why we have turned, uh, we, we have uh, got a turn referring to our funding money we have uh, at our disposal almost a billion euros a year. So now this money is going to be oriented in a way to help our fishermen to go with the rules, to obey the rules. So we're going to give them incentives. We're going to go for more selective gears and so on, just to give you an idea how we can uh, go for enforcement of the rules. But. To be honest with you, and this is uh, what I would like to underline, and I'm very happy that uh, Secretary uh, Kerry is here. I think that uh, we cannot do that alone. Nobody actually can do that alone. European Union, at least I can uh, speak be on behalf of European Union here, we cannot do alone. We're working with our member states, and I'm very happy for their support, but we cannot do alone. We need international cooperation. Let us take 
illegal uh, fisheries, and I'm very happy that Secretary Kerry underlined this target as a follow-up to our very, very important conference. We have 99 countries ratified this regulation for uh, IUU, pirate fishing, to make a long story short. So we can do that. I can say to you that the European Union already has gone for traceability and trade measures, so we have already banned the imports from three countries, and it had also a cost, a cost for the European Commission to, to take these measures because they are not popular, as we can imagine, in international community. And we have given warnings to 11 countries, and I hope that at the end of the day they are going to be cooperative and avoid the ban. But we need to work together internationally with teeth if we really want to stop pirate fishing. And pirate fishing is not just a detail. We have uh, uh, studies proving that 25% of the fish we eat every day is caught illegal. And sometimes we are talking about slavery conditions referring to that. So I think that IUU and um, the implementation of this regulation uh, is very important. Also, I was very happy to hear that the United States are coming to ratify the agreement, the port states agreement about the measures. This will be a great victory. So we can now sit together, all together, and organize because we need some other countries to ratify it in order to be implemented. This is another target I would like to uh, underline. Then about marine protected areas, and this is my last point. I was very happy to hear today all these very important leaders announcing that they are going to extend and extend and extend marine protected areas. We are going to do the same in the European Union. Already we, I have taken an initiative in Mediterranean, and I'm very happy that Prince Albert, Monaco, but also France, Italy, we are discussing about it. And I hope that this is an idea that can be spread. But. Here comes a but, and I would like to say something. I think that we need also to coordinate this at a global level, because in some areas it is possible to go in an easy way and with not a great a social cost for um, marine protected areas. Uh, there are areas where tourism is present, so there we can uh, ban fisheries, I mean at least the trade of uh, uh, fish. But what is happening to other local communities where fish is a way of life and also is the only source of income, then we have to be very careful to create alternatives. That's why we have come with this blue growth proposal about blue energy, about aquaculture, sustainable aquaculture, about uh, other ideas, biotechnology, tourism, and whatever. So I think that um, uh, social um, sustainability, uh, as long as environmental sustainability, they can go hand in hand, and that's why the blue economy can play a very important role. I'm saying all that because I think that um, there is a bright future. Uh, let me, uh, from this, uh, uh, let me to end up to thank all the people who have helped me to make the change a reality. And I'm referring, for example, to one million people who have signed for stopping the discards from United Kingdom and uh, other European um, uh, countries. I would like also to thank the leaders that have helped me, and I can see some faces here, very important leaders and uh, from United Kingdom, Prince Charles and uh, his foundation, and also Prince Albert and other important guys. I would like to thank the uh, U.S. government because we have supported me, even if you don't know that, perhaps. But you have really supported me because uh, I had an argument that we have a good example to follow, and this is United States. And believe it uh, or not, in Europe this was a very, very important argument to have. So thank you all. Uh, we have done it together, and I hope that uh, we are going to have a bright future for our oceans. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner, for your remarks, but for your work and your dedication. I've got it stuff. Uh, when Under Secretary Novelli decided she wanted to put the program together for this conference, she said she wanted to make it really creative. So we next have a duet. Um, you uh, 
may have heard that partisan fevers are running high in Washington. You may have observed that these days. Sometimes Congress seems gridlocked. Uh, but thank goodness, politics sometimes does actually stop at the water's edge, at least where oceans policy is concerned. Senator uh, Lisa Murkowski and Senator Sheldon Whitehouse are the co-chairs of the Senate Oceans Caucus. Their bipartisan leadership helped the U.S. recently become the 11th country to ratify the Port States Measures Agreement, as Commissioner Dominaki just, just mentioned. With once 14 more countries sign on, will go a long way to combat, combating black market fishing. So please join me uh, in welcoming two great leaders in the United States Senator, in the United States Senate, Senator Whitehouse and Senator Murkowski. Thank you, everyone. Let me, uh, I'm Senator Whitehouse from Rhode Island, and um, let me start with just a personal expression of appreciation and gratitude to Secretary Kerry for this extraordinary conference. This is uh, an idea he has nursed since days in the Senate when we were trying to pull together an EPW Commerce and Foreign Relations mega hearing on oceans and uh, being secretary allowed him to bring that dream to fruition and we're very proud of that and also thank John Podesta for the way that he has harnessed and focused the energy of the White House on climate and environmental issues. So to the two Johns, thank you very, very much. Now we've heard about how there are dead zones occurring in the ocean from an excess of nutrients. Uh, some might argue that the Senate is a dead zone, <laughs> also caused by an excess of nutrients. <laughs> but there are, there are bright spots. And uh, Senator Murkowski and I started an Oceans Caucus that pledged itself to be bipartisan and to focus on the issues where we could find bipartisan support. And they include uh, working on marine debris, which is an issue we really haven't tackled yet much, but we're looking forward to working with all of you on it. And ocean data monitoring. And most importantly, and where we've had success already, uh, what is called IUU, or in our phrase, pirate fishing. And uh, pirate fishing matters an enormous amount to all of our states, but perhaps none more than the state of Alaska. I'm so tempted to say arg. <laughs> I'm 80s or something like that, okay? This is supposed to be a very serious subject. But when we, when we talk about these issues that impact our ocean, whether it's the issue of ocean acidification, whether it is pirate fishing, whether it is marine pollution, these are very serious and very significant. And so the opportunity that we have as colleagues to come together on a bipartisan basis and really a, a bi-coastal basis, if you will, to, to really come to understand what we are dealing with when it comes to our oceans. We, we often use the, the, the phrase, we know so little about our oceans, we know more about the other side of, of Mars um, than we do our oceans. So knowing and understanding, making sure that we have the data, the research, the, uh, just an understanding is key. And we ne then need to take that understanding and then move to translate that into policy. So one of the issues that Senator uh, Whitehouse and I are working on is the issue of IUU or pirate fishing. Let me give you just a little bit of, of an idea as to what it means to my state of Alaska. We lead all the states in terms of both volume and value of our commercial fisheries. We've got about 1.84 million metric tons worth about $1.3 billion. We account for over 52% of the nation's commercial seafood harvest. So to us, this is, this is quite 
significant. And we're very proud that we're recognized throughout the world for our for the quality of our seafood and the sustainability. I would imagine that the wild salmon that you are eating on your plate comes from our waters, and I'm proud of that. One of the areas that we have seen very negative impact, though, with our, as it relates to our fisheries, is what we're seeing with the illegal harvests um, of, of king crab by the Russians. This has been a, a problem for us since 1990. In 2011, NOAA seized 112 metric tons of illegally harvested Russian king crab. It was being shipped to U.S. markets through the Port of Seattle fisheries. But we've got a, a pretty fancy little handout here. 99 million pounds of illegal Russian crab affects American jobs. American crabbers lost an estimated $600 million. Coastal communities have lost millions in tax revenues. 40% of the king crabs sold in world markets during 2012 were from illegal Russian harvests. But it not only impacts the communities, it impacts, uh, it, it jeopardizes the fisheries, but it also brings in other illicit activities, whether it's human and drug trafficking. These things absolutely have to stop. And that's what the Port State Measures Agreement did. It was the first binding global agreement that combated sought to combat IUU fishing and to prevent the illegally caught seafood from getting to market. So how, how we deal with this in a coordinated and a coherent fashion is, is very important. I'm going to mention just one issue or one intercept that happened this past month. It was a boat that was detained by the U.S. Coast Guard for illegal drift uh, fishing in the North Pacific. But the coordination that happened here was the boat was spotted by a Canadian aircraft with the assistance of Japanese monitors. It was seized by the U.S. Coast Guard cutter Morgenthau with the support of Chinese law enforcement officials. So it's everybody coming together to really work with multilateral cooperations. We've got a great team with the U.S. Coast Guard, with NOAA, the State Department. It really does make a difference. And the fact that we have the intention to get this done and have the intention to get this done on a bipartisan basis does actually make a difference. It may uh, surprise you, four treaties, the Port States Measures Treaty and the Three Fisheries Treaties, might not seem like a big deal, but the last major treaty that the Senate uh, approved ratification of was in 2010. And you have to go back many years to find four significant treaties that have been passed. So it was a significant achievement for bipartisanship and for the oceans when all four of these treaties passed on the same day and because of the uh, good work by my colleague and, and energetic work by our staff, by unanimous consent, without objection, uh, on the Senate floor. And it was, it was mentioned uh, just briefly, but there are other governments, of course, that have stepped forward uh, to ratify the port state measures. We appreciate that. We thank them for that. The European Union, Norway, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, the Seychelles, Chile, Gabon, uh, New Zealand, Oman, Uruguay. We would certainly hope that the representatives of, of other national governments that are here today uh, will express their support for the port states measures. Um, again, it is a multinational, multilateral uh, imperative. Another issue that the Senate, Co uh, Senate Oceans Caucus has been working on, again, in a very uh, bipartisan way, is, is how we will deal with marine debris. And this, as we know, is is enormous in, is, in its size and its scope. The ocean knows no borders, no boundaries. The earthquake and the tsunami that followed in Japan in, in, in 2011 was a tragedy on many, many levels. We all know more than 16,000 lives lost, devastating coastal communities, but approximately 5 million tons of debris were swept into the ocean from docks that were found floating on the coast of Oregon, 
barrels, styrofoam, uh, buoys. In, in my state, I had an opportunity to go to the, the shoreline outside of the community of Cordova and just see what had come to our shore. I guess that's where the border of the ocean ends is when it meets that land. Three years later, the debris continues to arrive on Alaska's very extensive coastlines. Uh, communities are volunteering. They're stepping up to coordinate cleanup efforts to remove what really are unprecedented levels of, of debris. But again, this is an example of cooperation. The Japanese government very graciously has provided $5 million to help those five Pacific coastal states with tsunami origin uh, debris impacts, which is greatly, greatly appreciated. We'll have the Commerce Science Justice Bill, Appropriations Bill on the floor this week, and contained in that measure is uh, is six million dollars that will go towards marine debris. Uh, again, it seems like a, a drop in the bucket, but working together, we're making little bits of headway there. So on pirate fishing, we're determined to get these treaties completed and the enabling legislation for them. That's our plan on that topic. On marine debris, we are moving forward and are open for business for your suggestions and ideas. We've heard a lot uh, during this conference that so we hope to incorporate into that work. And the last issue is ocean data monitoring where we are looking at uh, trying to improve and uh, reauthorize the integrated ocean observing system and the international system that it is a part of. We are looking at trying to find a way to get observers off of fishing boats and replace them with technology so that they don't have to give up a berth and the food and everything else to put a, an observer on board. We're looking at uh, trying to take advantage of the big data capabilities that the modern computers provide so that fishermen can become collectors of data and it can be aggregated without having to uh, waste essentially all that effort from a science point of view. There are technical ways that you can add equipment to lobster pots and trolls and bring up data with the catch in ways that are very, very low impact on the fishermen and ones in ways that actually in Rhode Island have been incredibly well received by our fishing community and, and who knows, if we play our cards right, we might even be able to get an Oceans ARPA out of it. For those of you who know what DARPA and eARPA are, it's the uh, Advanced Research Programs for Defense and for Energy. An Advanced Research Program for Ocean Data would seem to me to be a sensible thing to think about. So we work very well together, as uh, has been pointed out. Lisa's a Republican, I'm a Democrat. She's West Coast, I'm East Coast. She's the biggest state, I'm the littlest. <laughs> But we are working hard to get this done together, and I'll let uh, Senator Murkowski have the last word. Well, it is important that, that from Alaska to, to Rhode Island and all places in between, there is that coordinated effort to, to address the many challenges that face our oceans, the opportunities uh, as well. We've got great fisheries management that we see uh, in the North Pacific, but these don't happen by accident. Uh, we will have the Magnuson-Stevens Act reauthorization before us. This established regional fisheries management council system some time ago. It's a pretty unique system that allows federal and state officials to work with fisheries stakeholders, resulting in responsible, sustainable management of our nation's fisheries. I think we have a good story to tell when we talk about our sustainably managed fisheries. But again, it takes a coordinated effort. We have so much to do. What, uh, what we neglected to, to mention was the very first Oceans uh, Caucus meeting that we had. We focused on the issue, issue of ocean acidification, trying to understand more as policymakers where we are how we can address it, some of the many, many challenges that present themselves there. We will have many challenges in front of us, 
uh, speaking as, as a northerner and from a state that makes the United States of America an Arctic nation, it's imperative that we know and understand what is happening with a changing and an evolving Arctic, what we need to do with respect to, to infrastructure, what we need to do to better understand uh, the ocean seabed, recognizing that we do not have the mapping, we do not have the, the charting. So there is, is, is much to be doing together, but it doesn't get done unless you're willing to work together for the common good. And that's what I think you're seeing represented here today. And uh, thank you, Senator, uh, Secretary Kerry. I still yeah. call him Senator, Secretary thank Kerry. Thank you, Secretary Kerry. Godspeed you on your course. Well, those two senators come from about as far apart as you can in the United States, but I think you'll agree with me there's no continental divide between the two of them. They're really tremendous leaders, and I think they model how we need to move forward in terms of cooperation, collegiality. So thank you for being uh, with us here. Thank you for your work uh, and sharing those comments. Uh, for all of recorded history, the oceans have been crucial for trade and commerce. Today, it's critical that we use the tools of trade and commerce to help protect our oceans. Mike Froman is the U.S. Trade Representative. As President Obama works with partners in Europe and Asia to forge new trade agreements through TTIP and TPA, Ambassador Froman is making sure that uh, marine conservation and responsible fisheries practices are part of that agenda. So please join me in welcoming Ambassador Mike Froman. Thanks, John, and uh, thank you, Secretary Kerry and Kathy Novelli, for organizing this terrific event and for uh, letting me slide my way into it. Uh, this is, to paraphrase Vice President Biden, a big deal. <laughs> now, when we're talking about sustainable oceans, trade policy isn't necessarily the first thing that comes to mind. But as this conference has underscored, in a variety of ways. Keeping the oceans healthy requires us to use every tool at our disposal, and trade policy potentially is a very powerful tool. The United States is currently negotiating two of the most ambitious trade agreements in history, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership with the European Union and the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP, with 11 other Asia-Pacific countries. In both of those agreements, strong and enforceable environmental provisions are central objectives of the United States. And because of the sheer size of those agreements, together they cover two-thirds of the global economy, they provide an important opportunity for advancing the agenda we've been talking about here today and raising international standards at the nexus of trade and the environment. From the beginning, we've seen TPP as a potential model for other trade agreements to take on environmental sustainability issues, particularly illegal logging, illegal wildlife trade, and illegal fishing. Uh, yesterday, I had the opportunity to go to Kennedy Airport and meet with the men and women of Customs and Border Protection and Fish and Wildlife Service and look at all of the illegal wildlife that they have interceded at the airport. And it's that kind of effort to cooperate, share information, reduce demand and intercede and prevent the trafficking in illegal wildlife that we're now working with our TPP partners to put in place. And in TPP, we're also seeking groundbreaking commitments to protect our oceans, commitments never seen before in trade agreements. We're working to advance sustainable fisheries management, including management systems that are based on internationally recognized best practices and the best scientific information available. We're working to combat illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. And I do like the term pirate fishing so much better than IUU, so I hope we can, uh, we can borrow that from you. Uh, we're working to promote the long-term conservation of sharks and other threatened marine species. We're working to address marine pollution issues, including by pressing our TPP partners to implement and effectively enforce the commitments they've made under the International Convention for the Prevention of Pollution from Ships, or MARPOL. And very importantly, we're working to prohibit some of the most harmful fishery subsidies, such as those that contribute to overfishing. This is an important issue because for the last 13 years at the WTO, 
We've tried to make progress on disciplining fishing subsidies, and there's been very little progress indeed. TPP gives us the opportunity to have a breakthrough on putting disciplines on fishing subsidies that lead to overfishing, and we hope we'll be able to work with the European Union in the context of TTIP on that as well. These provisions build on our commitment to implement CITES, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora. And while the details of these pr uh, proposals are not yet fully agreed upon, we're making progress, we're gaining momentum, and I'm confident we're going to bring back a good agreement. When completed, TPP will include the most advanced environmental chapter of any tra trade agreement ever negotiated. And it will be fully enforceable through the same strong dispute settlement mechanisms that apply to other obligations in the agreement. Let me leave you with a final thought on globalization. Globalization has affected all of us in different ways. There are positive aspects, there are less positive aspects. But either way, it's a fact of life. The choice that faces us is not whether we can roll back the force of globalization. It's whether we can shape it or whether we're going to be shaped by it. And this is true on issues ranging from wages and working conditions to the appropriate level of environmental protection. Through TPP and TTIP and our other trade negotiations, we're seeking to shape globalization to level the playing field by raising standards from labor in the environment to intellectual property rights and a free and open internet. We're pursuing a trade policy that's consistent with both our interests and our values. But we'll only succeed in raising those standards when we succeed in negotiating those deals and securing congressional approval for them. You're all here today because you're leaders and opinion shapers, including my, my fellow panelists. And if we all care about the issues as much as I know we do, we can't afford to lose an opportunity to have a significant impact. I look forward, from our position at the Trade Representative's Office, of working with you to further this agenda. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mike. And I want to uh, once again thank Senator McCoskey and Senator Whitehouse Commissioner Damanaki for your thoughtful remarks and for your leadership. Across continents, across cultures, across centuries, the ocean has been central to the story of humanity. I don't think there's ever been a person who has visited a beach or glimpsed a distant spot of water from a whale watching boat or watched land slip behind the horizon and the sweet sea well up on all sides and not come away changed by the experience. The ocean has fed us, it has carried us great distances, it has fueled our trade and commerce, it has inspired our myths and legends, our artists and our scientists. Today, our oceans are in danger. Overfishing and illegal fishing, climate change and acidification, marine pollution and dead zones, as, you, as you've heard. These are man-made threats endangering the global ocean in spite of its enormity and its power. From the earliest days of his administration, President Obama has been committed to rebuilding the health of our oceans. Early in his first term, the President released the National Ocean Policy, which seeks to create a coordinated, science-based, proactive approach to managing and aligning the many marine resources and uses of our coasts and ocean. I'm, I was proud to announce last week that two of the voluntary regional planning bodies working under the National Ocean Policy will have comprehensive regional marine plans out the door by the end of President Obama's time in office. From Maine to Virginia, regional plans will be in place to balance commercial fishing and energy development, shipping and military exercises, infrastructure, and environmental protection. Since 2009, thanks to science-based reforms passed by Congress and the hard work of local communities and of NOAA, we've largely ended overfishing in federally managed waters and a record 20 fish stocks have been rebuilt around the country. After decades and sometimes centuries of overfishing, that represents huge progress, and we're going to see more stocks rebuilt in the years ahead. But we know we have to do more, and that's why, as President Obama said in the video this morning, he announced two key initiatives to improve the health and sustainability of our oceans. First, the President today released a memorandum that creates a new task force to combat black market fishing uh, activities. While scientific ma uh, management has made U.S. fisheries 
vastly more sustainable, the United States imports the vast majority of our seafood. Illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing constitutes up to 20 percent of the wild marine fish caught each year around the world and drains up to $23 billion from legitimate fishing enterprises. Operating outside the law, these pirate fishing vessels take in fish without regard to the to sustainability of ocean ecosystems, not required to fi file trip plans or to carry transponders. The ships become vectors for criminals who traffic in guns, drugs, and human beings. Different federal agencies are already working to combat illegal fishing through a variety of measures, but today's presidential memorandum calls for the task force to recommend a comprehensive strategy within six months to take on illegal fishing and seafood fraud, a strategy that will consider each step of the seafood supply chain, from international enforcement to uh, imports and inspections to labeling and marketing. This comprehensive approach will give consumers confidence that when they go to a restaurant or to a fish counter, their fillets were caught legally and they were labeled correctly. The President's also committed to using his executive authority to preserve ocean areas for future generations, as we already protect our most beautiful environmentally significant landscapes. He's directing the administration to immediately begin taking the steps necessary to expand protections near the Pacific Remote Island Marine National Monument that was created by President Bush in South Central Pacific Ocean. This area contains some of the most pristine tropical marine environments in the world. These tropical coral reefs and associated ecosystems are also among the, uh, the marine environments facing the most serious threat from climate change and ocean acidification. To make the right decisions about the scope and details of future marine protections in the South Central Pacific, or elsewhere for that matter, we'll carefully consider input from fishermen, from scientists, from conservation experts, from elected officials, and other stakeholders. So that input process will begin immediately, as of today, so that we can complete the expanded protection of these great spaces in the very near future. In the next two and a half years, we'll be redoubling our efforts across the federal government to promote responsible ocean stewardship, to continue rebuilding fish docks, to study emerging threats like ocean acidification, and to protect and preserve ecologically and culturally valuable marine areas for future generations. Taken together with the commitments being made by other countries here at this inspiring conference, I'm confident that we, that we can be as good to our oceans as our oceans have been to us. Thank you for letting me participate in this great conference. Thank you, Secretary Kerry. I look forward to working with all of you.